Good morning. Welcome to Calvary. We're glad that you're here this morning. You joined us. Uh, if you're visiting, you come with family or friends. We, we just want you to know we're, we're glad you're here. And this, this is what we call a family gathering. So welcome to the family gathering. Um, we're we're uh, looking at the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John. We've been making our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Gospel of John. We got as far as chapter 13, verse 36 last week. And so we're going to pick up there in verse 36 and um, continue our, our study through the life of Jesus. If you remember, Jesus has gathered with his disciples in an upper room. They're there to celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus, before they ever partake of this meal, Jesus uh, takes a robe and he gets a basin of water and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples and he tells them, this is the lesson that as I've done to you, you go and do to others. And it was a picture that the, the greater came to serve the lesser, right? And, and really that's the lesson that um, he had left for us, that we're to be the servant of all, right? We're, we're here to serve others. That, that's, that's the model that our Lord had given his disciples. And so Jesus had given them that. Right after he had washed their feet, it tells us that he exposed that there would be a traitor in their midst. And it was Judas Iscariot. And uh, Judas now has left the room. Who's going to go betray him for 30 pieces of silver? Judas has now not only departed, but he's making a deal with the religious leaders to have Jesus arrested. And so all of that's happening in the background. Jesus also, uh, in that passage, had told them that now he's going to be glorified. And, and what he was speaking about is that the events of his arrest and then his, his trial and the crucifixion have all been put into place now. Judas not only um, you know, betraying him, but now uh, all of those things would begin to fall into place as they would have him arrested, right? So he says, I'm going to be glorified. Now, th this, this is what's, what's incredible. Jesus, at that very time, that very moment, he tells the disciples, I'm going to leave you guys. Look, look, at, look at verse 33, just to back up a second. He says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say it to you. Right, So Jesus has told them, look, I, I, I'm about to leave you guys. And you're going to be here. You can't follow me. You, that's not something you're going to be able to do. They don't understand what Jesus is saying. Even, even though he had been telling them over and over again what he was saying, they didn't understand it. And so Peter takes Jesus, pulls him aside, and he begins to have a conversation with Jesus. It's there in verse 36. That's where we pick up. He says, Sin, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? I, I love Peter. You know, Peter's always like, wait a second, we got to, something's not right here. I mean, you know, you got some explaining to do, right? And <laughs> he's, he wants more information. You know, you're leaving us and, you know, where are you going? We, we don't get this thing. And then Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And, and you know, I, I believe Peter was sincere. I, I believe Peter was, you know, all in. He, he was desiring to do what he said he was going to do. But Peter didn't understand that in his own power, he didn't have the ability to do what he had claimed he desired to do. And what, what he's going to do at this moment is, is Jesus is going to turn to, to Peter and he tells him there in verse 38, you will... Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And what Jesus turns to Peter and says, you, you, you're going to lay down your life for me, really? You're going to deny me? Before morning comes, before the sun even rises, Pete, <laughs> three times you're going to deny me. Can you imagine what the... What the, the kind of the, the atmosphere in that room was. 
What they had learned just in the last few, you know, minutes that, that Jesus was talking, they had learned that there was a betrayer. They didn't know it was Judas yet. They thought that Judas was going to buy some goods or he was going to go give some money to the poor. So Judas had left and they didn't know Judas was the betrayer. So they, they know this. There's a betrayer. Jesus is about to leave them and there was a denier. All in their small group of 12. Okay, I mean, I, I know, <clears throat> you know, you get bad news. You kind of, so, something like kind of hits you and you, you just, you, you, you can get pretty discouraged or overwhelmed or, you know, just feeling, feeling helpless or hopeless. And here these guys got three different kinds of bad news. <laughs> Two of them were, were, you know, one, one's going to deny, one's going to betray, and then Jesus is going to leave, right? All, all of that had just happened, and then Jesus turns to them in chapter 14, verse 1, and he says, let not your heart be troubled. What, what do you mean? <laughs> Don't let my heart be troubled. Did you, you know, aren't you in the same room with us? Don't you know what's going to happen at this point? That word that he uses for your heart being troubled, it's a word that means to be agitated, to cause inward commotion, to take away uh, the calamity of your mind. He says this, it, it's also to speak of the spirit of fear and dread, to perplex the mind of one by suggesting scrupulous, scrupulous or doubts. And so, so what, what Jesus says, don't, look, don't, don't be freaked out right now. Don't be troubled. And after hearing everything that's going to go down, you know, you would, you would think, how can they not be troubled? How can you not be, you know, perturbed, perplexed, discouraged? And yet Jesus tells them, look, don't, don't, don't be troubled. And then he tells them why they're not to be troubled. Look, look what he says in verse one, verse, chapter 14, the end of verse 1. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. You believe in God. And every one of these men had believed in God. They, they were Jews. They, they understood, uh, you know, the foundation from, from Genesis chapter 1, that God had created everything, that, that God was the one who sustained everything. They, they understood that, that God had called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They understood all the miracles that God had done to take them out of Egypt and, and to bring them into the promised land. I mean, see, th these were men who had a foundation in their life, and they said, you believe in God. And every one of them would go, yeah, we believe in God. Of course we believe in God. We, we you know, we know of God's promises. He says, just like you believe in God, believe also in me. So everything that, that you know true, to be true of, of God, you can also know to be true of me. Guys, that, that, is, that is another evidence of Jesus's deity. It, it's Jesus putting himself on the same level with God, that he is, he is, in, he is, he is uh, divine. See, if I were to tell you, you believe in God, believe also in Ray. See, you're laughing, I, and I don't blame you. <laughs> but like, like, you believe in me, you got trouble. But Jesus can, can say emphatically, look, believe in God, believe also in me. And he can say it with, with, with confidence, knowing that everything that he declared, everything that he's going to tell them, everything he had told them, it's all going to it's all going to be declared to be true. And, and, and so he says, look, here, here's how you, how you settle a troubled heart. Believe in God and believe also in me. And you believe that everything I've declared to you is going to come to pass. And then Jesus goes and he's going to tell them what is to come. Notice what he says beginning in verse 2. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. And what's incredible is that Jesus is giving the disciples a very clear picture. Every one of them would have, would have, would have related this particular story to a, a marriage ceremony. You see, if, if, a, if a man went and proposed to a wife and she said yes, what would happen is he would leave and he would come back at an undisclosed time. And while he was gone, he's preparing a house 
for his bride. If, if dad had any kind of, uh, you know, land, if he had a house, if he had any kind of money, what he would do is he would go back to dad's house and he would build a second story. And then the second story is where he would take his new bride after it was done. So he'd come back and unannounced, he would bring her for this wedding ceremony. And before he ever picked her up, he already had a place for her to live. And Jesus gives that picture to these, to these men. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go, watch this, and I prepare a place for you. And he's talking about heaven. Amen. Guys, here's, here's, here's the amazing thing in, in, the, in, this whole, in this whole picture. Is that he's wanting them to be comforted, knowing that their eternal souls, their, 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 their eternal life was secure and they were going to be with him forever and ever and ever. And in the middle of trouble, I'll tell you what, that, that, that is the, one of the most comforting things that could, could ever um, happen to, to any one of us. When you know that God not only paid the price for your sin, that he's promised that you're going to be with him for eternity. It, it brings some kind of, of anchor for you. It's some kind of like, you, you know, you can do whatever you want to this body, but I know where I'm going to spend eternity. You, you, you can destroy this tent. You, you, you can wipe it out. You can cripple me, but I know this. One day I'm going to shed this tent and I'm going to be with God forever in heaven. And he's gone to prepare a place for me there. Guys, th th this is why Jesus tells them the these words at this moment. Think about how discouraged they were, how, how bummed out they were. A traitor, a denier. And then Jesus is, is going to depart. I mean, wh you know, what's, what's, what is, what's left? And Jesus goes, look, don't, don't worry about it, guys. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You're going to be with me in heaven. We're, we're going to be. Now, you know, There's so little given to us about heaven. I, I, I wish there would be like a whole book just on what heaven's going to be like. Right? But, but we do have some idea of what, what heaven's going to be like. It tells us in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it, it says this. It says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, right? He says, look, no matter, this body can be destroyed, but we, we, we got an eternal home. So we, we, we know that there, there's an eternity. We know that you're going to have a, a new house when you get into eternity. In the book of Revelation, let's turn there real quick. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. He gives us a little insight. Verse 3, we'll, we'll begin there. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Watch this. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. They shall, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words are true and faithful and he said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. I give, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. Watch this. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Man, I mean, there's, if you read the rest of the chapter, and we, we don't have time, but he's, he, he goes and he, he describes, you know, what the foundation's going to look like, what the streets are going to look like. He says the gates are all going to have, you know, they're all going to be made of a pearl, and each gate is going to be one pearl. Can you, I mean, I can't even fathom that, right? What heaven's going to look like. And, and, God, and Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I, I read one comment. He says, can you imagine what heaven's going to look like for... It, it took God six days to, to make the heavens and the earth. And for 2,000 years, he'd been preparing a place for you. What's that going to look like? 
right? He, he's, he's got something special in store. It, it, it says that the pavement, the streets are going to be pure gold, that, but gonna, it's going to be transparent. The walls, transparent. I mean, you know, you're just kind of like, man, I, I can't even wrap my And I, I think God meant it that way. I don't think he, you know, wanted to give us too much information. You, you, you ever kind of know what's going to happen ahead of time and you just kind of like, you're not, you're not satisfied with what's in front of you? Kind of like you, you got your, your vegetable plate there and, and mom says, you know what, as soon as you get done, here's this dessert. Ice cream sundae with, you know, fudge hanging over the top and whipped cream and cherry. And you're just looking at that dessert going, I, want, I don't want to eat this. Give me the dessert. <laughs> And I think if, if we all knew what heaven was like, I, I think if we, if we had a greater picture, we'd be going, man, I don't want to live here. I want to give me there. Yeah. Right? And so he, he's laying out this picture for us. He wants us to understand, look, God's preparing a place for you guys. He's going to come back. And you, you know what I, I, I love at the end of verse 14? He says, and if I come again, I will receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. He goes, I, I'm going to come and get you. I'm going to take you there. You, you, you're not going to, you know, you don't just, your soul don't just depart from your body and you just kind of go like, man, I got to go find out how to get to heaven. Jesus says, I'm going to come and get you. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to walk you there. I'm going to, I'm going to let you, you know, show you the way. He says, I, I, I'm coming again and I'll receive you to myself. Now, I don't think he's talking about the rapture of the church here. Although I believe in the rapture of the church. I, I, I believe, you know, he's, he, one day there's going to be um, a trump that's going to blow, that the church is going to be taken out of this place. And it'll happen right before the seven years of tribulation begin where God's wrath is being poured out upon the world. Right? I mean, that's an event. But I, I think he's talking about our personal departure from this world. I'm going to come back and get you guys. Every one of these disciples died a martyr's death, except for John, the beloved, who died. He, it wasn't that they didn't try. They tried to boil him in a vat of, uh, of boiling oil, but he didn't die, so they threw him on the island of Patmos. That's where he received the revelation that we read in, at the end of, uh, of, of the Bible. Well, do you know, what, you know what's incredible in, the, in this whole picture as you look at this? Is that Jesus promised, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to bring you to myself. Just like the, the, the groom would come and get the bride and then take her to his abode, his new home, he says, I, I'm going to do that for you. And every one of them that died that martyr's death, man, Jesus was right there. It's interesting, when you, when you read the account of, of Stephen being martyred, it says that Jesus stood up and he received him right as, as Stephen was being martyred. And I believe that same thing happens for every believer, man, that Jesus comes and he takes us to himself. Now, now Jesus is telling them these things. He says, look at verse four, and, and, I, and, I, and I love this because in verse four, he just simply says, look, where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now, G Jesus had spent the last three and a half years with them. He had been preparing them for this moment. He had, he had been teaching them, you know, parables and lessons and, and, you know, talking about heaven. I mean, he's laid out for them all of these things. And Jesus goes like, you, you guys, you know where I'm going. You know, you know how to get there, guys. I mean, you know, we, this, this is already a, a, a lesson we've already gone through. And, and, I, and I love that Jesus had that much confidence in, in, their, in their disciples. Like, you, you, guys, you guys know, you know, you get it. I'm going, you know where I'm going, I'm going to heaven. I mean, he didn't tell them that, but he, you know, it's kind of like he's assuming that they know that. You know how to get there. You know, we, we've already had this conversation already. And then it says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how can we know the way? I love Thomas, doubting Thomas. He's, he's, he's got a reputation. <laughs> Tom, Thomas goes, look, I, 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 need, I need some clarity here. This is too important of a question and too important of too you know too too important information for me to not know exactly what you're talking about. And Thomas just simply just says, "Look, I I need to know some more details here. I don't know the way. I I I I I don't know where you're going. I mean, you 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 need. And I think for Thomas, man, I I, I appreciate Thomas. I appreciate that Thomas, you know, gets this clarity because he's he, now Jesus is going to give us one of the most 
basic, simple explanations of how to get to heaven. And it was all because you had a man here that, that was willing to ask directions. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. How many of you guys have never asked directions in your own life? You know, they like, I, I, I'll, find, I'll figure it out. I'll get there on my own. No, gee, Tom is going, look, I, I want directions. I'm going to write those directions down. I want to make sure that I get to the destination and that I, I don't get lost along the way and I don't, I don't get confused along the way or I don't get deceived along the way. I need directions to get to my destination and that's heaven. And so he asked that simple question. How do we get there? And Jesus in verse six explains to the disciples how to get there. Watch what he says. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Guys, that one verse just dispelled every other way, truth, or life. Because what Jesus is claiming emphatically is that he is the way and what he's declaring is that there's no other way. There's not, there's not many ways to heaven. Our, our world doesn't want to embrace that right now. Our, our world wants us to declare that there, there's multiple ways to heaven. You can get to heaven through Buddha. You can get to heaven through through Krishna, you can get to heaven through Muhammad. I mean, it just depends, you know, what way you want to take. There's multiple roads to heaven. And Jesus says, look, there's only one way to heaven. Amen. And that one way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm a way. He said, I am the way. And, and what, what, he, what he declared here is that there, there's, there's not another path that you or anyone else can ever take in order to reach the destination of heaven. And I think the, under, the, uh, the apostles understood what Jesus is declaring here. I, I believe they understood it very, very clearly because Jesus declared it clearly. When they were, when they were arrested by the Pharisees in, in Acts chapter 4, they're, they're telling them, you know, don't, you know, stop talking about Jesus. And they're, they're trying to, to threaten them. And in and, and Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says this. Now, there is salvation. No, he says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. See, he's just declaring what he had heard Jesus say in an upper room. There's not, there's not another name that can get you into heaven. There's not another path that can get you into heaven. There, there's not another road that can get you into heaven. You see, Jesus is the way to heaven. Amen. He'd also declare that he was the truth. He's not only the way, he is the truth. He, he's not one of many truths. There, there, there's, there's not a, a, another truth that, that could ever, um, you know, contradict what Jesus has declared. It was, it was in the book of Ephesians chapter four in the 20th verse. I, I love uh, how the apostle Paul would, would kind of declare that. He says, for you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him, you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. There's anyone who comes and tells you that there's, a, there's another truth. They're lying to you. Jesus is the truth. And, and, and the only way you're going to know that truth is you get to know who Jesus is. And Jesus is going to expound upon that in verses 7 through verse 11. He's saying, me and the Father are one. I, I, I don't come in my own authority. I, I'm just telling you what heaven's declared. I'm telling you what the Father's already told me. And I'm just declaring it to you. The works that I do, it's all because, you know, God's the one doing them. I, I'm, I'm just the one that's, that's, you know, declaring them for you. I'm just the one who's performing them for you. But it's all in the heart of the Father. And what, what, what he wants you to understand is that there's only one truth. 
There's not multiple truths. We're in, we're in a society that wants to, wants to say, well, just we know whatever works for you or whatever truth you hold to or whatever path you want to take. No, Jesus says, look, there's only one truth. There's, there's the truth. And you can believe the truth or you can believe the lie. And anything that, that, that contradicts that truth is the lie, right? It's just anything that, that opposes that truth is a lie. And what's incredible is that we as the church have been called to what? To be the ground and the pillar of truth. We're, we're to be holding up that truth. That, that, that's why whenever the world declares something and it contradicts the word of God, then I have a responsibility to say, wait a second, what the world says is wrong and what God says is right. Amen. Amen. That's what truth does. I like how, how, how Paul would uh, write to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15. He says, if, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Emphatic, the truth. That's what, that, that's what we as a church are supposed to do. And we find that many churches are no longer doing that. They, they're, they're, they're embracing a social gospel. Social gospel, just, you know, we're, we're just here to, to, you know, feed the poor and, and, and make sure that, that uh, you know, we, we, we pay the, the light bill for, for those who, who don't have enough money. And really, you know, our whole job is just to show the love of Jesus. And, and they leave out the whole truth part of it. And I don't think you're helping anybody. I think you're hurting people. Because if you don't tell someone the truth, man, that God loves them and he died for their sins and, and that their sin would keep them out of heaven unless there's repentance and a change of heart and, and the spirit of God comes in and, and begins to transform your life, man, you're, you're, you're gonna live a, a meaningless life. You're gonna live a life as separated from God for all of eternity. And how, how cruel is that if you know that truth and you don't declare that truth to somebody? I don't call that a, a, a gospel at all if those things aren't being declared. And it's incredible because Jesus tells them very emphatically, look, not only am I the way, not only am I the truth, but he says, I'm the life. I'm the life. And I think there's so much wrapped up in that one word, that he's the life. If you were to go back to, to John chapter one, verse two, let me read it to you. John chapter one, look at, look at verse two. He says, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Watch this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see, here's, here, here's what he's declaring. He says, look, G Jesus not only gave life. He, he, he's the one who, who breathed life into mankind. He, he breathed life into, into the animal kingdom. He, he's life, the, 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 you know, the plants and the earth and every, everything that, that exists. It's because he gave it life. He is life. But not only is he life and, and, and that he gave life, he, he, his life is the only life that has value and meaning and purpose. In other words, you, you, you can live a life, but you can live a life that's void of purpose. He's, he's the one who gives you life. The only reason that, you know, you were created was, was for him, for his glory. And if, and if you live a life that's contrary to living for him and for his glory, then your life, you know, is, is, is diminished in its value. Diminishing its purpose. And so Jesus said, look, I am not, I, I'm not only the way, I'm not only the truth, I am the life. And if you're going to know life, if you're going to experience life, if you're going to know the, the very reason you're, you're, you're created, if you're going to have any meaning, if you're going to have any value, then, then, then you got to know me. He's it. And he's the one that gives you Purpose. The only, the only way you can, you can ever find true happiness is in Christ. You see, our, our world's trying to find happiness, and, and they think that, that, you know, the reason they can't find happiness is because, um, you know, social 
injustices and and so there's there's this whole this whole other you know um social justice that that that's being taught in our colleges and taught in our schools and being propagated throughout our nation and what they're saying is look um if if i just had the same chance or it was just as fair in order to make it fair i i gotta undo everything else you know and there's this this philosophy that that just destroys culture and destroys our world Guys, the, the, the problem with our world isn't justice. The problem with our world is that we've rejected God. Amen. That's the problem. Amen. And you're not going to find life in any other, any other pursuit, any other avenue. We think, well, if we just had sexual freedom and, and, and that, that, that's, you know, our gender freedom and we're, we're, our whole world's, you know, thinking that if we can, we can just change everything, that somehow you're going to find happiness or you're going to find the, you know, the, what, what real life is all about. None of that's going to ever do it. It's been tried. It's failed. The only life that's worth living is the life with Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. And, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing because those who oppose that say, well, you're, you're so narrow-minded. You know, you've you, you got to be open a little more to, you know, other religions or other, other belief systems. You've got to be a little more, you know, embracing. That's just so narrow. Now, I, I don't think of it that way. At all. I, I, I'm grateful there's a way. Because before I came to Christ, there was no way. Before I came to Christ, there was no truth. There was no life. I, I, I was living it aimlessly and purposely, you know, without purpose. And, and, and when, when you finally come to Christ, you go, man, I, 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 found, I found truth. I found life. I found, I found the way. And so it's not that there's only one way. It's thank God there's a way. It's not that there's only one truth. Thank God there's a truth. And that there's life. Jesus would say it in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. He says it like this. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus told his disciples, look, it, it is a narrow gate. The way it leads to destruction is wide. You know, masses of people go through that path. But the way to eternal life, it's a narrow path. And Jesus just, just explained what that narrow path looks like. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's the narrow path that, that, that'll lead you to the Father. There's not, there's not another path that can do that. I think there's, there, there, there's, there's another implication in, in this passage, and, and it's um, Jesus j- just, just telling that it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not just a path, it's a person. It's not the truth, it's a person. It's not just a way, it's a person. You see, it's, it's Jesus who embodies the way, the truth, and life. It's him. And so you have to embrace him. And, and, and I, I, I love that idea because what, what he's declared is, is that, you know, there, there's, there's not another avenue for you, for you to find in order to, to, uh, to find happiness or peace or purpose or life or truth or, you know, or, or another, another path to take. He says, I, I, I'm it. I'm not a way. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to show you the way. I'm not pointing the way. I'm the way. And I, and I think... He, 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 he makes it so simple. So, so you know, so you, 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 it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, take that and, and, and twist it or, 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 or try, to, try to, you know, revise it. Jesus just says, so simply says, look, it's me that you need. And let me tell you, what, what you need is Jesus. And he's the one who satisfies and gratifies He's the one who promises eternal life. 
you take him and you, 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 get, you get all of it, right? It's just, he, he's it. Look at verse seven. And, and, and now he moves in, in, at this point and he begins to um, explain to his disciples a, a little further. Look at verse seven. He says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. What did that, I mean, Jesus is going, look, if you know me, you know God, you know the Father. Matter of fact, when you see me, you see him. Guys, Jesus came into this world to declare the Father and his declaration is the Father and him are one. Now, look, look, look at this next verse. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. That is sufficient for us. <laughs> I, 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 if I was Jesus at this point, I would have been pulling out my hair. <laughs> Thomas, you know the way. No, we don't know the way. Look, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Show us the Father. Right? I mean, you're just like, who did I recruit? <laughs> I don't think Jesus was frustrated at all. I, I think Jesus is trying to, trying to grow them into an understanding of who he was. And, and what he declares at this point, he says, have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now here, here, here's, here's what, the, what, what Philip's th- thinking. He says, you know what, God, if you would just show us just a glimpse of the Father, you know, j- just let him pass by like Moses did. I mean, you know, I, I, just give us, let us see the Father. That would be enough. I'll, anything you say at that point, you know, we're in. And he goes, Philip, I've been with you this long. These last three and a half years, you've watched everything. You, you were part of, of you know, every teaching that I gave you. You've seen every miracle that I performed. You, you mean to tell me that you don't get it yet, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Jesus says to them, verse, verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. I mean, and th- th- this, is, this, is, this is kind of the, 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 the whole picture here. He's saying, look, don't you know, everything I've declared to you, it, it's, it, this wasn't from me, this was from the Father. We're in agreement, we're, we're, in, we're one, we're in alignment, everything I say. Guys, and, and so th- this is what's amazing. If you want to know God, you study the life of Jesus. Because in studying the life of Jesus, you understand the heart of the Father. They, 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 the, the authority came from the Father and Jesus is declaring these things and the Father and Jesus are one and they're, 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 they're in in agreement with everything. So everything Jesus says, the Father says. So you, you, you want to know what, what life is. You want to know what eternity is. You, you want to know what truth is. You want to know what the way is. You want, you want to know what life is. You see, you look at the life of Jesus because Jesus declares it all. And, and what, what he's telling his disciples is, look, even all of the works that I've ever done, it's, it's been through the authority that the Father has given. So they are working in unison together. And he ends in verse 11, this particular section, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, no no one had done the miracles that Jesus had done. The lepers were healed of their leprosy. The blind had gained sight, the lame were walking. You see, Jesus was, you know, the, the, the woman with, with a flow of blood for 12 years. I mean, I mean, Jesus was doing miracle after miracle after miracle, and no one could do those kind of miracles unless God were with them. And he says, if you don't believe me because, because of what I'm telling you, believe me because of the evidence that I've given you that I and the Father are in unison together. We're working together, that I am him, he's in me, that you know, we're, we're uh, working uh, in, in, in conjunction with each other. And so he 
declares to them very, very, very clearly here that they, they, they were working um, and, and the father was working through him and in him and you know the, the, there was no separation there in, in any way. And then verse 12, look, look, here's the word again, most assuredly. Remember we've been looking at that word, Jesus saying it quite often in these last few chapters, verily, verily, or amen, amen. And what, what, what it is is, a, is an opportunity for, for him to tell you, look, pay attention right now. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a second, he said that we're going to do greater works than Jesus did. The miracles that Jesus, I mean, the things that Jesus accomplished, you're telling me that it's just his disciples, those who are to follow him, are going to be doing greater things than that? Now, they, and, I, and I think, you know, oftentimes, I know when I first read that, it kind of took me back. Like, we're supposed to be doing miracles. And I believe God's still the God of miracles. I believe God can still heal the blind and, and, and the sick can, you know, those with cancer can be healed from cancer. And I've seen God do that on, 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 on you know, many occasions I have. But guys, I'll tell you something. Someone who's blind and they get their sight, that's only going to last for the rest of their human life. So that someone who's lame and now they can walk, you know, 20, 30, 40 years until they, till their, their, their tent eventually wears out and they... they shed this tent, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it, all of that is temporary. But for someone who was blind spiritually and they can see spiritually, that's a greater miracle than someone who was blind physically and they can see physically. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, it says, and 3,000 souls were added to the church. In one day. That was a greater miracle than, 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 than everything that Jesus had done up until that point. Because now the Holy Spirit was living inside of these apostles. And then they were going to go being out and they were going to preach the gospel. And there was going to be a, a, a revival that would take place in, in the hearts and souls of men throughout the globe. So the, you, you ask the question, what do you mean greater miracles? Greater miracles is to see, see people that are dead come to life spiritually. That's a greater miracle. Someone that was going to hell all of a sudden because they put their faith in Jesus Christ, they're going to heaven. That's a greater miracle. You may be here this morning and, and you're heading down that path of destruction, man. You, you know, you, the, your sin has got a grip on you. Drugs, alcohol, you're, you're, you're living an immoral life. And in one moment, man, by faith, you can ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. And right now, a miracle can take place as you pass from death to life. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at, man, you, God can transform your life this morning, right now. If you would simply come and say, God, I, I, I'm, I'm broken, I'm messed up, and I need to ask you to change me. And the moment you do, the Bible says that you'll be saved. That's a miracle. That's a, that's a genuine miracle. Nearly 30 years ago now, man, I, a miracle happened in my life because I was heading down the road of destruction. Drugs, alcohol, you name it, moral total depravity in my heart and my mind and I remember that that day man when God spoke to my heart and, and it was it was it was like from one day to the next my the way I saw things changed my life changed my priorities changed my purpose changed I remember picking up this book and I began to understand what it said because a miracle I had read the Bible uh, you know many times I never understood they all sound like gibberish to me but when that miracle took place, when, when the Spirit of God came and lived inside of me, all of a sudden, this was like, man, th th this, this makes sense. And God began to reveal himself to me in greater ways every day, man. And, and it, was, it was a miracle that took place. So when, when you read that passage and, and you go, well, well, greater miracles are going to happen to those who follow him and those, those who, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you, over the last 30 years, man, I've seen, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ right here in this, in this church. And it's, it's nothing short of a miracle every time it happens. 
Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to change lives. And Jesus gave those disciples that power to go and spread that message so that God's work would continue to change lives. Now, look look what he says in verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. I, I, I think, man, w- what an encouragement to pray. But I, I, I think that passage can be misconstrued as well. You see, G, you know, in Jesus' name is not a formula. You can't go, Lord, I want a Lamborghini in Jesus' name. <laughs> right? That, <laughs> that's not how that prayer works. And there's some who, 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 who you know, teach that. They, they, you know, that if you say anything in Jesus' name, he's got to give it to you. He already promised. I mean, he can't go back on his word. He, you know, so, and, and, but, see, but the, the, praying in Jesus' name isn't just the formula. Let, let, let me tell you what, what it is. It, it, it is giving you um, that you're praying in the nature and in the person of Jesus. In other words, your prayer is in agreement or in line with Jesus. If you're going to go and say, hey, go tell him I sent you, you know, you, you, you're not going to tell him to do something evil if someone who sent you was good. And so what Jesus is saying is, look, if you're in agreement with me, if, if we're in alignment together, you're, you're in li- aligned with my name and who I am and my person, and you pray, you understand that your prayer is going to be answered. God hears your prayer. He knows what you're going through. He knows exactly what's happening. And there's often times when I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, you know, I, this is my prayer, but not my will, your will be done. I, I pray that almost, you know, it, you know, part of my prayer. It's because I can only see what I think or what I want. I, I can tell you how many times I prayed for something. I thank God he didn't answer my prayer. Because it wasn't in the will of God. It it wasn't the heart of God. And I think what he's declaring is, look, you you line up your heart with my heart. You you begin to pray the things that that are in agreement with my my will, and you're going to see God do miracles. And so where our prayer is is a a prayer that's in, in line with God's Nature. It's in line with God's heart. There's an Old Testament passage in Psalm 37. And, and if you're taking notes, write that down. Psalm 37, verse 4. And this passage, I think David understood that same principle before Jesus ever declared it. Psalm 37, 4. He says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Guys, delight yourself in the Lord. You know what that means? That means that you're just, you're just hanging with Jesus. You're just hanging with God. You're, you're delighting yourself in him. You want, you want his will. You want his purposes. And when you begin to delight yourself in the Lord, he says he gives you the desires of your heart. Why? Because the desires of your heart have lined up with the desires of his heart. And when, you're, when your heart's lined up with the heart of God, then you, you, you can rest assured God's going to do things that you never would even fathom, that then you couldn't even comprehend. I mean, can, I, can I give you a, a little insight here, guys? Let me tell you something. You want, you want to know the heart of God? The Bible says this, God wills that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's God's heart. He wills none would perish, but all would come to repentance. So when you're praying for the soul of your mom, your dad, your uncle, your aunt, your brother, your sister, you're praying in the will of God. And God's going to give every opportunity for that mom, that dad, that brother, that sister, that uncle to to come to faith in him. He's he's, he's, he's going to put everything in front of them because you're praying in, in his will. You're praying with his heart. James would say, look, your prayers, you ask amiss so you can spend them on your own pleasures. And he, and he says, look, if you would just line your prayers up with the heart of God, then, man, you would see God do all kinds of miracles. 
And so how, how's our prayer? We're, we're, we're going to end here. We'll, we'll pick it up next week. We got communion this morning. But one of the things I, I think is important here is that you, look, you look at this. Everything that Jesus just declared to his disciples. Look, he, he tells them very, very, very clearly, very plainly. Look, I have a place for you, man. You're going to be with me for eternity. Guys, church, we need to know that right now because our, our, our world is changing. And we may face persecution. We may. I, I, I don't know. But I, I'll tell you what. I, I'm starting to see a lot more of, of, of our, our culture rejecting truth. And let me tell you, because we stand for truth, they're rejecting us. And so it may, it may be a, a time when you, you're here going, realizing, you know what? Man, I got a place in heaven. So you can do whatever you want here, man. But I know where I'm going. Amen. Amen. And I think it's something that we need to hold on to. I think in in this passage he 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 gave us the the, the very the very the simple you, you want to share someone you know the gospel John, John fourteen six Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father except through Him I mean how much clearer does that get right and I think that's a passage that we all need to be holding on to and you know sharing with people you know I, I'm not I didn't say it Jesus did and if I love you I mean I I have an obligation to tell you that He's the only way you're going to get there. And then you, you look at this whole picture where Jesus just says and says, look, me and the Father, we're, we're one, man. What I declare, what he declares is all the same. We're, we're, we're in unison, we're, you know, we're, we're in authority, and that you have access to me through prayer. You, you and I have access to the throne of God. I, I love it. The Bible says this in Hebrews. He says, we have a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses, and he's there interceding on our behalf. Not a cold thought. God, God, God knows exactly what temptation feels like because he lived here. And he knows what you're going through. And you can come to him with every issue you ever had and he's able to answer that. He's there to, able to, to minister to you in the middle of that because he loves you. And this morning, we're, we're, we're about to take partake in communion. And communion's, again, another, another declaration of God's love, right? It, it's the declaration of God's love because he gave his life in exchange for yours. He, he, he shed his own body, his own blood, so that you can be forgiven and you can have a relationship with God. You, do you realize God loves you that much that he would die in your place? And all that he's looking for, for us or from us, is that we would acknowledge that we're sinners and we need the forgiveness of sin and that he provided for it for us by dying on a cross and by shedding his blood on our on our on our behalf and the bible says the moment you believe that the moment you embrace that the moment you confess that you need him as your lord and savior is the very moment that you'll be saved you'll you'll pass from death to life and so before we partake of communion man i i just want to make sure that if you have never made that decision that this morning, man, you have an opportunity to do that. The opportunity to say, you know what, I, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I need Jesus Christ to come and wash me by his blood and forgive me for my sins. And then I want to invite his Holy Spirit to live inside of me so I can have life now. And so if you're here this morning and you've never asked Christ into your life, before we partake of communion, communion's for those who've embrace that, who's, who, who's confessed that, acknowledge that need. If you've never done that, man, we would love for you to partake of communion, but I'd warn you, man, if you reject that, then please don't partake of communion because you're bringing a greater judgment upon yourself. That's what the Bible says. You're bringing a greater judgment. Why? Because you acknowledge the body and the blood, but you don't, you don't embrace it for yourself. And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray right now. And I'm going I'm to give you an opportunity, man, if you have yet to receive Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle that, that could ever happen in your life could happen this morning is you by faith say, God, I need you.